It is a commonplace of literary history that the story of Dido as told by Virgil has been among the most controversial episodes in the entire epic, prompting extensive and often impassioned debates over centuries in which conflicting viewpoints on Dido's tragedy and Virgil's presentation of it have been upheld through the media of both scholarly and creative writing, an artificially polarised distinction, of course, in the pre-modern period. In the history of Virgil's status and reputation in post-classical Europe, Gavin Douglas, as his first and arguably finest translator, holds a central place, and Douglas, as both scholar and poet, contributed with his characteristic vigour to the debate. His extensive prologue includes a brief but decisive statement on the topic. Since Virgil's intention was to present Aeneas as a pattern of all worship, manhood and nobility, he could not have attributed an act of treachery to him without undercutting and negating his entire poetic purpose. From this it follows on Douglas's showing that Aeneas' desertion of Dido was not blameworthy, and this he argues on various grounds. Aeneas acted according to the command of the gods, so that the responsibility for his action was theirs and not his. Dido had been informed from the outset that the Trojans' ordained goal was Italy. Aeneas made no promise to her, and therefore... And therefore... Better? And therefore could not be held guilty of promise-breaking. He left her with ruthful heart. Douglas in his prologue expresses high praise of Chaucer, but takes issue with him, prefacing his stricture with the graceful acknowledgement that he himself is as far excelled by Chaucer as Chaucer is by Virgil, that for his presentation of the Dido story in his Legend of Good Women, my maester Chaucer greatly Virgil offended, he argues, by asserting that Aeneas was forsworn, but then Chaucer was, quote, ever God, wa God wait, all women's friend. <laughs> <laughs> this decidedly pro-Aeneas stance was, of course, not the most popular, perhaps not even among Douglas's compatriots and contemporaries. His secretary and scribe, Matthew Geddes, presumed to add a note to the manuscript among the sections of Douglas's own commentary, denying that the command of the gods excused the traitor of, traitory of Aeneas nay his man-swearing, since they were not true gods and therefore had no special authority. <laughs> <laughs> and saying of Douglas's third point, here he argues better than before. <laughs> Geddes' reference to the sweet Dido shows clearly where his sympathy lay. Douglas, however, commits himself firmly to the other side in the debate. His interpretation of Aeneas in the prologue is complemented by his lines on Dido in the prologue to Book 4. The relevant section begins, Thy double wound, Dido, to specify, I mean thine amours and thy funeral fate, Who may indite but tears, with e'en dry. This acknowledgement of the heartbreaking force of her story, however, is balanced in the next stanza by the sternly judgmental, Fae nobleness, wealth, prudence and temperance, In brutal appetite for and wild dotage, Danter of Afric, Queen Funder of Carthage, Am while in riches and shining glow ringing, Through foolish lust, Froch thine ain undoing. <laughs> brutal appetite, wild dotage, foolish lust. Dido's fate must make any man shed tears, but her unbridled surrender to passion in itself deserves only censure. And Douglas, churchman as well as poet and scholar, proceeds, proceeds to an eloquent denunciation of the power of false lust, returning at the end to Dido as a potent illustration, honesty, faith, and good fame were adieu. The tragedy of Dido and the reason for its power to stir our emotions is, and its value as a moral exemplum is not that she was abandoned by her lover, but that she was morally ruined by yielding to her passion. An interpretation which, of course, shifts the emphasis away from Aeneas and his part in the story. The one direct reference to him in this entire prologue, Alas, the while though knew the strange in e, 
presents him as a mere catalyst. Douglas's comments on the story from the outside, as it were, are clear and explicit. Much more intriguingly, however, further clues to his stance are given in the translation itself, in the words and grammatical structures which he chooses to translate Virgil's Latin. The loftiness of, Doug of Douglas's intention in undertaking the translation and his appreciation of the magnitude and the momentousness of his project are abundantly clear from his prologue, as we've just heard. The pean of praise to Virgil with which it opens is followed by an equally eloquent statement of the inadequacy, not only of his own talents, but of his language, his bad, harsh speech and lewd barber tongue, to the task of restating Virgil's poem. However, he goes on to say, having been prompted to the task by his patron, my special good Lord Henry Lord Sinclair, he will make the attempt, dedicating the book to him. He proceeds, combining vigour of expression with a most attractive mixture of modesty and confidence, to expound his methods and principles as a translator. Famously, he devotes many lines to lambasting Caxton's in Eros as a monstrous insult to its model. Notwithstanding the ferocity of his attack, his tone here is unmistakably not of mere malevolence, but of what C.S. Lewis in another context calls just, generous, scalding indignation. <laughs> that a poet deserving of such reverence as Virgil should have been travestied by as, in, as inferior a talent as Caxton's. The obvious enthusiasm which he applies to the task of demolishing the English writer does not alter the fact that his criticisms are sound and well-directed and he contrasts his own attempt to produce a complete and faithful translation with the blundering effort of the English author and his French model. And but my book be found in what sick three when it is read, they warp it in the sea. Douglas was in many respects as well qualified as any man of his time could have been to translate Virgil. He was a man of extensive learning, familiar as a matter of course with the Aeneid itself but also with the massive apparatus of scholarly commentary which had accumulated around it, and the great tradition of Renaissance humanist learning which had in recent times contributed to this. He was deeply and intensely, even passionately responsive to the work as poetry, and he was an accomplished poet in his own right, working in the rich, lively and confident literary ambience of James IV of Scotland. He was also keenly aware that his work would be widely read and subjected to critical scrutiny. He had the confidence to write, what can they better say first than God's name? But he manifestly wrote with an acute and powerful sense of his responsibility to his future readers, his scholarly contemporaries and predecessors, and above all, to Virgil himself. And he was under no illusions regarding the sheer difficulty of understanding Virgil. Again and again, he refers to the fact that even great scholars have been perplexed by some of the poet's utterances. Any translator, however skilled and dedicated, has at any and every stage in his work a number of choices to make. A situation where one and only one word or, or word sequence in the target language can possibly be employed to represent a particular word or word sequence in the source text probably never arises, and certainly not when the source text is a literary work of great elaboration and complexity. Douglas was, of course, perfectly aware of the impossibility of word-for-word -word translation, discussing the issue at length in his prologue. A good illustration of his response to this particular difficulty is his rendering of Sum Pius Aeneas, I am Pius Aeneas, as Aeneas says of himself, to him, as Ruthfully Ne am I, and the note in which he explains that, quoting Douglas, I interpret that term, pietas, whiles for ruth, whiles for devotion, and whiles for piety and compassion. For the many occurrences of the phrase pius aeneas in the epic, ruthful is, so to speak, Douglas's default translation, used not only when the context appears to call for a stress on the quality of compassion, but when no particular aspect of interpretation of pietas is emphasised. But his departures are often interesting. At its first appearance, line 220 in Virgil, 105 in Douglas, in which Aeneas is mourning the deaths of Orontes and other comrades, he is pitiful Aeneas. 
In the cheerful episode of the prize giving after the ship race, he is gentle in knee. When performing the funeral rites for his nurse Caeta, he is the ruthful and devout Prince Ini. Sacrificing to Juno, again the devout Aeneas, when vaunting over his fallen enemy Lucagus, the piteous Aeneas, surely a choice of which even Douglas must have had some doubt. And finally, when attempting to calm the warring factions after the breaking of the truce, he is a truthful and patient Aeneas. Not only does actual ambiguity or polysemy in the original often present the translator with the need to choose, so too, of course, do the exigencies of rhyme and metre. Douglas often, though not always, renders a hexameter line by a decasyllabic couplet, and the constant need for slight expansion of Virgil's utterances enjoins the use of words with no specific, specific equivalents in the Latin. Priscilla Bockert, in her landmark book on Douglas, discusses in fascinating detail his frequent resorting to words suggested by Ascentius and other commentaries for this purpose. Whatever factors necessity and condition a translator's choice on any given occasion, however, a mark of his skill as translator is his ability to avoid being forced to write something unsuitable, to use an inappropriate word for the sake of a rhyme, or a vacuous word to give a line the requisite number of syllables. Douglas's translation is the work of a man determined, as an almost sacred duty, to render Virgil as faithfully as the vast differences between their respective languages and poetic forms will allow, and abundantly equipped with the intellectual and technical skills called for by the task. It may be taken as given, therefore, that everything in the translation was written intentionally, after careful thought, and with the unswerving intention of conveying Virgil's meaning as completely and as accurately as possible. With these considerations in mind, let us begin by examining Aeneas' speech to Dido. It's in Book 4, lines 336 to 361. In Douglas's version, it's Book 4, section, five, section 6, 105 to 160. It opens with, O gentle queen. It's not quite the, very, the beginning of the passage that you've got. But it's, um, you see the beginning. O gentle queen, that's how I ne'er deny. Thy good deed and desert is ne'er worthy than do with words or tongue may extreme. O gentle queen, Douglas shifting Virgil's unadorned vocative Regina, ego te quam plurum afando, e numerare vales num quam Regina negabo. Regina, he doesn't, Virgil doesn't start with O gentle queen, he doesn't have the word gentle in at all. The vocative Regina is put well down the, the speech. Douglas shifting Virgil's unadorned, unadorned vocative regina to the start and implying an adjective with no equivalent in the original. At once, this imparts a more tender and sympathetic tone to his speech. If it should, be require, should require to be demonstrated that this is a device specifically adopted for the context, compare his rendering in a much earlier line, in fandum regina you base renovare dolorem. Thy desire, lady, is renewing an untellable sorrow, where the word corresponding to Regina is not emphasised in any way. The comparison which Douglas introduces in Thy good deed and desert is mere worthy than thou with words or tongue may exprime adds force to Douglas it to Sorry, adds force to Aeneas' tribute to Dairo. The word which he uses irk, nor shall it ere me irk, nor yet misseem, which is weary or tie out, corresponds in sense to the word pigere, pigebit to the side, pigebit, pigere, pigere. But the added misseem, irk or misseem, be unfitting, lends a new implication to Aeneas' response by suggesting a recognition on his, his part of a public as well as a private responsibility to her memory. And the adjectives in the worthy Dido and in fresh memory, neither in the original, convey something of the respect and affection which Virgil's Aeneas, all too well in many people's reading, of Nixus sub corde premebat, crushed down under his heart. Next, Virgil's imperative ne finge is softened to the rhetorical question, what needs to say to fame? 
the expansion of hic amor hic patria est, that, this is my love, this is my native land, to two whole lines. This is my lust new and delight at hand, there is my country and my native land. You see, Ferran, I've put in bold type the passages in the translation and the words in the Latin which exactly correspond to them that we discuss, um, that I'm picking that I'm picking out. The expansion of this hic amor hic patria is just half a line to two whole lines is surely calculated to arouse a reader's sympathy with Aeneas's motivation, as is the later rendering of the abstract and general fasts, right, with the much more emotive lesum and gain. The development of quae invidia est, to what rang is it, what cause or envy or shame, illustrates Douglas's careful choice of words. The general rang is by implication divided into envy, which could be Dido's, and shame, which could be Aeneas's. The latter making overt his awareness that his action could be seen as shameful. Similarly in let be to vex me or thyself to spill, spill which is destroying. Douglas translates in Kendary by two words, one semantically much weaker than the other, and makes Aeneas apply the stronger and more ominous to Dido. The suggestion, which is not directly in the original, the suggestion that Aeneas has a foreboding of her death, at least as a possibility, is surely a touch of which Virgil would have approved. That Douglas was constrained to alter Virgil's text in some respects is not an issue. What is interesting is that his choice of words seems consistently designed to invite a sympathetic response to Aeneas' speech and to avoid the cold and unfeeling tone which readers of all periods have found in it. Mistakenly, Douglas would of course have argued. The same effect is found in passages which frame the dialogue section. By expanding Virgil's Dixerat, back to the beginning, to an entire line, thus said the Queen Dido in feeble estate, just for the one word Dixerat she said. Douglas brings an interpolated phrase of which, though certainly it arouses compassion for Dido, the main function is surely to emphasise by contrast the positive adverb firmly, contrasting with in feeble estate. Aeneas answers firmly, which for, a, for obnixus applied in the next line to Aeneas. The semantic opposition being underlined by the alliteration and the symmetrical positioning of the words in, in their lines. The word will, most probably with the implication of desire, in the double translation of curam sub corde premebat, as refrain it his will, hide in, his, hide in his heart his thought makes to avert the fact that Aeneas is forced to act against his inclinations. Later, in lender, rendering lines 393 to 5, he again selects Ruthful to translate Pius. Often, as already noted, this choice has no special significance, but here it is surely intended to emphasise the tragedy of Aeneas' emotional conflict by focusing on the precise aspect of, of his pietas, which at this moment he is forced to resist. The dolorous queen is clearly suggested by dolentem, Virgil's word, but it is of interest that the meaning of solando is conveyed not by an etymon such as solace, a perfectly familiar word, but by mis, which by its phonesthetic simplicity conveys a touching suggestion of closeness and intimacy. The overtones of the word mis, placate, calm or soothe, are somewhat different from those of comfort in the next line. Douglas carefully selecting his words to avoid otheosity. By translating Cupid as foo busy with, this is curious, busy implies diligent activity and has not the possible humorous or deprecatory overtones of the modern word busy. But Aeneas is not taking active pains to comfort Dido, though he wishes he could. Douglas's indicative whiz must therefore refer to imaginary actions and convey the strength of his longing so to proceed. Finally, in this passage, Douglas's expansion of multa gemens to bewailing Michael her sorrow and distress not only emphasises Aeneas' painful awareness of Dido's sufferings, but a touch which shows his artistry as a poet rather than a translator enables him to rhyme the last word with natheless. The contrast of adverb placed in this unusual position at the end of the line 
pointedly stressing the gulf between Aeneas' feelings and his actions. Aeneas' encounter with Dairo's ghost in Book 6 is similarly retold in such a way as to maximise sympathy for him by emphasising his own unavailing sympathy for her. As Aeneas in the epic is always Pius Aeneas, so Dido is in Felix Dido. And Douglas's, un Douglas's usual word for in Felix is unhappy, which in Middle Scots, unlike Northern English, still retained its etymological sense of unfortunate, ill-fated. The written word miser in Virgil, Douglas often translates by a word such as woeful of Dido, sorry, Dido speaking of Zacchaeus, Cative, Simon speaking of himself, or a poignant example, wretched caitiff, Dido of herself. The line in which Virgil first uses the phrase in felix dido longum quebe bebat amorem is translated as unhappy Dido, the langsome love drinking in what fool called. Douglas's additions powerfully reinforce the chilling portent in the word's application to a queen who at this point is at the height of her good fortune. Here, however, he makes Aeneas address her with O fae Dido. He used this word, meaning doomed to die, early in the poem, in the phrase the fae unsile Dido, unsile meaning unfortunate, translating in Felix on its first application to her. But thereafter, not until in Felix Dido mortem orat, the fae Dido after death pray it. Its specific verbal association with her death gives it a bleak appropriateness here. The expansion of Reiken Savumere to the vividly emotive the green wound gaping in her breast on you is shortly followed by another amplification in Virgil's Demi sit lacrimus du cheekin quiad fatus amore est it is probably the adjective which has suggested Douglas's adverb tenderly, dociqui. But he underlines the strength of Aeneas' feelings by supplying heartily for heartfelt felt to modify love and the verb begrat, lamented. By contrast, funeris hu tibi causa fui is rendered straightforwardly and without expansion as alas, I was the cause of thy deed, death. The ruthless clarity with which Aeneas perceives the consequences of his past action being forcefully suggested by the stark simplicity of the vocabulary and the emphasis which the trochaic inversion imparts to the pronoun. Careful placing of the words is also evident in the ordering of imagine michtai never. A tone of urgency is added to his final plea to her to wait and hear him out. Sisti gradum tequi aspectu me sub trahi nostro, me sub trahi nostro. By the breaking of Virgil's single sentence into three, each opening with an, a, an imperative, de Stint thy pace, abide, thou gentle wicht, withdraw thee not, say sin, further my sect, is he ran. The interpolation of thou gentle wicht carries a bitter irony in that the qualities associated with gentleness are the last things you can expect from Dido at this moment. The unobtrusive say sin, so soon, underlines the inexorability of her parting from him, and even the singular my sect unlike Virgil's aspectu nostro, our sight, places a moment momentary emphasis on his personal grief. One of Douglas's finest poetic gifts, and one of his most individual and most notable characteristics of his entire translation, his ability to present a scene with dramatic vividness, is shown in his use of a much expanded translation of the following narrative passage. At both the beginning and the end, two lines have become five, to convey the futility of Aeneas's pleas. The interpolated full of woe, full of woe, is not so much balanced as hopefully hopelessly overbalanced by full of wrath and iron. Virgil's ardentim, burning, flaming, has suggested both awe and flame it and glow and hate as fire, the phrases being dexterously separated to avoid any seeming redundancy. The repetition of aversa, Latin, from Dido's reaction to Aeneas' exculpatory speech in Book 4 is faithfully rendered. In both instances, Douglas writes with awkward look, meaning angry or aggrieved. The word whack, applied to Aeneas' tears, is conspicuous through being placed in a rhyming position and has no corresponding word in Virgil's text. 
His connotation here is surely of helplessness or powerlessness, lacking an ability to fulfill a suggested or intended function, is the SND's definition. The change of the noun ceremony to the active clause as he spake momentarily brings into explicit focus the contrast of Aeneas's eloquence with Dido's unmoved silence. Corripuit sese is rendered by the beautifully onomatopoeic Foo swift she whisks away. Douglas used that verb early of her, or earlier of her, she whisks wild through the tune of Carthage. This time the verbal correspondence is not in Virgil. And to match its implications, Aeneas fast after her first sprint for rust. Douglas again choosing a verb which is both semantically and phonesthetically important. Finally, Virgil's last two words, miserature iuntem, becomes, and had pity of the distress that moved her say to flee. Expanding the phrase to emphasise the sorrow of both characters, but retaining the comfort comfortless conclusion of a verb signifying their final parting. Douglas's translation in all these passages clearly invites a sympathetic reaction to Aeneas on the reader's part. By contrast, though he could never be, char be charged with minimising the compassion for Dido which Virgil's writing evokes, in certain passages at least, his choice of language seems to emphasise her guilt. In her first utterance of the thought of possible marriage to Aeneas, this is not in your handout, she refers to it as culpa. Douglas, Douglas strengthens this to crime and interpolates in this rage. Later, the same word culpa is again forcefully augmented, but cleeps it spoosage, and with that fair name, cloak it and hint her crime of open shame. For conjugum vocat, hoc praetextit nomine culpa. Underlining the condemnatory tone of Virgil's word, both by the expansion and the contrast with that fair name, which refers to marriage. Shortly afterwards, anti pudor quam te violo aut jura resolvo is again rendered with much greater emphasis, or I become so shameful, wretched wicht, that I might honestly file or woman heed, or break your laws, nay, while I be deed. Douglas is at pains to stress Dido's awareness of the moral culpability which she would incur by yielding to her passion and her determination at first to resist it. The potently dysphemistic Scots word final comes in effectively here. Of course, the special expressive possibilities afforded by the Scots vocabulary are skillfully exploited by Douglas throughout. Another instance of interest in the present context being Dido's horrifying thought in her last speech of how she could have destroyed Aeneas and his company, further envenomed by Douglas's Scots vocabulary as sign, swack the gobbets in the sea by force and eat yon Yon same Ascanius, he trench it with a sword. Honestly, as a quality which Dido loses, compare the lines from the prologue to this book already quoted, Honesty, Baith, and Good Fame were a Jew, is again referred to in Virgil's Nequianem Specie fama, Famavi Movetur, which becomes, For neither the fashion nor the manner she attends new nor fame nor honesty. The word has various associations and nor fame nor honesty could conceivably be intended to suggest a contrast between the way things are reported to be and the way they actually are. But it is much more likely, particularly in recollection of those earlier occurrences of the word, that the real meaning is the face value statement that Dido forgot her good reputation and her principles of good conduct, a sense at most only implicit in Virgil's line. Similarly with the word woman heat, this is a highly charged word, denoting the admirable qualities most becoming a woman, frequently used in Middle Scots poetry. It is a key word, for example, in Henderson's The Testament of Cressid, also a poem of a guilty woman whose fate nonetheless excites compassion, and would certainly have resonated powerfully with Douglas's original audience in For thee is woman heed went, and worship bathe, for te propter extinctus pudor, the word is chosen not merely for the alliteration. The moral interpretation of this crucial episode in the epic is thus clarified by Douglas, both in his statements as a commentator and in his, po his poetic rendition of the story as a translator. And in his presentation of Aeneas and Dido, he displays not only the verbal skill, but the profound empathy with and loyalty towards the intentions of his model, 
which marked the translator's art in its highest development, an achievement all the more remarkable when it is remembered that poetic translation as a literary form was still barely established. The conflict which readers through the ages <coughs> have felt, as Virgil surely intended from the very outset, between respect for Aeneas's stern adherence to his duty and sympathy for Dido's heartbreaking fate, had been examined long before Douglas's time and has continued to arouse passionate debate ever since. But this pioneering translation con constitutes one of the strongest and clearest statements ever made on the topic. Finally, it is of interest to note that the Dido story has received memorable treatment in Scottish literature of recent times. A central episode in Ian Crichton Smith's novel, The Last Summer, set in a Highland community during World War II, is a class discussion among six-year pupils, one of whom is suffering the agonies of unrequited love of the Dido story, prompted by one pupil's response to the word Pius. It's just her, that I thought of his leaving her and then Virgil calling him Pius. The ensuing debate leads the characters into deep waters and evokes strong emotional reactions. One boy expressing the view that the race is more important than the individual, and another retorting that that is what Hitler says. In the course of the discussion, the teacher, impressed by the seriousness and intensity of his charge's feelings on the issue, develops on one boy's rhetorical question, what kind of Rome would be founded by an Aeneas who could do that kind of thing? To was Rome the kind of place that was corrupted from the beginning? An interesting idea, very interesting indeed. More recently, the historical novelist and classical scholar David Wishart, in his book and his novel I, Virgil, heartily recommended, suggests precisely this, by offering through the fiction a radically revisionist view of the Aeneid as a bitter criticism of Augustus and the results of his policies. And in the field of poetry, one of the high water marks of the post mcdermott violence movement is Sidney Goodser Smith's Dido in his poem sequence Under the Eildon Tree. Gavin Douglas would have recognised a brother and peer in the poet who wrote, On the cellar shore she stood, a simmer sea, the lippers curdling cream at her sandaled feet. The sun like a titan's gong reared in the Empyrean, loud on the gowd and sail of the farthest ship of all, new half foot to thought the bay, unheeding the flea and fleet like an emperor erden abin his reeving kin. The gowd and sheet like a sheet to hammer new mind o'er, Thereafter, fast in ye with Iris leal hurt, and never yins hilt to hint for fear and traitory and shame at them. <coughs> the one that drave his ships rank on rank of them, sun on the flichter in feathery oars, the fame spindle of spume, lambers and speed, sea gay and wolves a pack, wild beasts o'er the emerald spays, their pennants brick like tongues in the wind, swan wings spread, their green and Utrecht. Craigs of swans drink in the wind for Italy. Aeneas's fleet speeding away for Carthage and Afric's burning queen, we are lasses broken hurt, and e'en our rin we greet. And the like wind that took her false man aft, streamed through her sable hair root blown, sheer black as Ethiop nicht, wild her raven glory streamed in the wind, the speed flung main or near or Araby any and in the race, our silver sand. Blood cast of the rack for liberty. The unpent clued of midnight, midnight streamed in the dry simoon, sheening like jet in songs or splendid nin. But Douglas would have had much to say against Smith's presentation of Fossini in his poem, in particular of his conclusion Yon nicht the lift our Carthage pleased, and Diane's silver disc was dim as Dido and her palace burned. The orange, scarlet, gowd and laus. Had ye wild protest to the centuries, Queen Dido burn, and burning, tashed Aeneas' name for I with skeletry. And both Douglas and Smith would have thoroughly enjoyed the encounter. Mm -hmm. Thank you.